Welcome to the new format for Great Lakes Church online and the Great Lakes Church podcast. Services now available on demand Sundays at 9 o'clock a.m. Central. Announcements available at the beginning of each service. To skip to the talk, please refer to the timestamps in the description. Enjoy the service. Well, welcome to Great Lakes Church. If we've never met before, my name's Justin. I'm so glad that you found time to be with us, whether you're online or you're in one of our auditoriums. What a cool week for you to be with us. I have the privilege of making sure I help you navigate what's happening here this week. And so let me just try and put it in three big categories. One, we are ending a series, which means we get to do communion at the end of service today. But two, we get to hear from one of the favorite voices around here, our our good friend, Lawrence Kirby. And third, we are gonna kick off our preview for this Christmas season and what this church is gonna get behind with its Christmas offering. So you pick a great week to be here to hear a little bit more about where our Christmas offering and our efforts are gonna make a difference this year. I wanna kick it over to our good friend, Carson. Hey, Great Lakes Church, my name is Carson, and this week we are exploring the fastest three minutes in Christmas offering history at Great Lakes Church. That's right. What you need to know is that this year's Christmas offering comes in fives. There are five grand initiatives inspired by the five G's here at Great Lakes Church that we'll cover one per week for the next five weeks. The five initiatives we're taking on for our Christmas offering this year, let's start with number one. We are advocating for the overlooked. We're doing this through partnerships with Shepherd's College and Royal Family Kids Camp. Shepherd's College is a Christian-based post-secondary program designed for students with intellectual or developmental disabilities. And our goal is to partner with them to help students build community by funding picnic tables and creating different welcoming environments throughout the campus. In addition, we're continuing our partnership with Royal Family Kids Camp to provide a week-long camp for kids in foster care. And we are gonna cover all of the food for all of these kids that they can feel like royalty, even if just for one week. Our second initiative is to care for the extreme poor, those in situations where they are without hope just because they don't have access to the right dollars or resources to get them out of their difficult situations. This continues our partnership with Charity Water to provide clean drinking water for those who don't have it. This year, particularly 280 students in Cambodia. We're also providing appliances for all homes built by Habitat for Humanity in 2023 in Kenosha. In the same vein, we're working in tandem with Sleep in Heavenly Peace to provide beds for kids who are sleeping on floors, saggy couches, and air mattresses so that they can get good sleep and excel in school and beyond. And to round out this section of caring for the extreme poor, but perhaps most significantly, we're partnering with El Paraiso Church in Honduras, particularly their tech school. They're building a tech school to ensure that individuals in their community from a young age have the means to weld, to industrial sew, to computer programs so that they can raise up the next great generation of leaders in El Marañón. All right, gang, you're doing a great job. We're not slowing down as we move into phase three, which is equipping healthy marriages. We wanna start something new, a healthy marriage fund here at Great Lakes Church to ensure that when couples need help through counseling, through financial support, or perhaps just through retreat, we wanna ensure they have the rights and the means to be able to do so, to bounce back in what may be a hard season of their marriage. Our fourth initiative is to train and invest in the next generation through our kids and students programs, through special events, internships, and continued excellent programs week to week here at Great Lakes Church. We are seeing so much growth and engagement in these programs and we don't want the momentum to stop because they deserve to have an anchor in their soul so that they don't drift far from God when life gets crazy. And to round it out with initiative number five, with just a little bit of time left, we are starting a new church this year in Nicaragua. We aren't just building, but we are going to invest even in the staff to ensure that the people of this vastly underchurched region of the world will have access to the same hope and the same community that we do here in Kenosha and Racine. So we would love if you would join with us because this is not only starting a church, but this is an investment opportunity for the future as we send kids and students and families to go do mission work here at this church. This will be a church that we can get behind consistently over time, and we are so excited about it. Now, y'all, like I said, over the coming weeks, we're going to have opportunities to dive more into each of these five overarching initiatives, but you can also read up for yourself with the Christmas flyers that are located around you if you're in our physical spaces, or you can go online to greatlakeschurch.com slash Christmas to read more if you're joining us digitally. We love you, and we can't wait to celebrate Christmas with you through our generosity this year.
Well, Carson, thanks so much for giving us a preview of the impact we're gonna get a chance to have this holiday season as we get ready with our Christmas offering. I think this is the time of year where I always remind myself that yes, for so many of us who are in the habit of giving, our regular offering makes a huge difference here week in and week out. But for what we are able to do above and beyond that goes towards this Christmas offering. I know we have the biggest goal ever that we've had in Great Lakes Church history in front of us to raise $200,000 over our regular generosity. And here's what I know, every year this church has shown up. And so I'm excited to see not only um, who and where we make an impact, but how from right here in Southeast Wisconsin, we can have an impact in the world. So if you came prepared to give today, you can give online. You can use the blue envelope in one of our physical locations in the seat back in front of you, or you can always download our app and give that way. But however you choose to be generous today, we simply wanna say thank you for believing in what we do here. So we've covered a lot, but there's one last thing. If this is your first time here, we are so grateful that you took the risk to hang out with us, whether it's online or in one of our auditoriums. Um, and we don't wanna miss the opportunity to give you a chance to say hello to us. And so there's a connection card in the seat back in front of you or online at greatlakeschurch.com. If you fill one of those out, maybe you have a question, maybe there's a prayer request, maybe you just simply wanted to ask us what's happening around here. Um, we want you to know, you can bring that out to our next steps table. And we would love to simply say, thanks for being here and give you a gift for being here. All right, I think I've got it all covered. And so in just a second, the lights are gonna go up. Pastor Kirby's gonna take the stage. Let's get wild, let's get crazy, and let's welcome our good friend, Pastor Lawrence Kirby. What's up, family? How y'all doing? Good, 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 good. Um, first, let me just say, um, support the Christmas offering this year. Um, I don't think you guys realize how many families are blessed by the generosity of this church. Ministries uh, throughout this city, throughout the region, and throughout the world. Uh, One Voice Church was able to launch kids ministry and be able to invest in the next generation because of the generosity of Great Lakes Church. Uh, so thank you, Dave, and to all of you uh, that gave in last year's Christmas offering. Uh, you guys were a tremendous blessing to the work that we're doing over at One Voice. Um, so thank you, and I just pray that you guys continue to be generous in that way. Second thing, and don't start my time because I'm not preaching yet. <laughs> um, Y'all don't know this, um, but, but they be giving me grief about my outfits when I come over here uh, to, to talk. Um, and, and I just need to share a perspective with y'all. Uh, one is not right or wrong, it's just different. Um, some folk get dressed uh, out of practicality, right? It's, you know, this is warm, this fits, this allows me to do what I need to do through my day, right? It's comfortable. Uh, uh, some folk get dressed uh, out of, it's art. So, so, when, so when I get dressed, it's art. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like I'm thinking about um, Comb Delane, who started Kid Super, who made these pants, uh, and, and, and his artistic design as it relates to, to his approach to making pants. I'm thinking about Isaac Paleo, the, tired, uh, the talented painter out of L.A. that did a collab with Fourth Rope that made this hoodie. You know, I'm thinking about concepts, collaborating with Nike and designing these sneakers. For me, getting dressed is art. Y'all feel what I'm saying? Okay. So Dave stopped me in the lobby. What is that hoodie? What does it mean? It don't mean nothing. It's just art. All right, now start my time. Here, here go the message. <laughs> One is not right or wrong. Do, do your thing. Everybody don't, you know, do your thing. But when I get dressed, it's art. And if Dave would give me more Great Lakes merch, I would definitely wear it on the stage. I see these hoodies floating around. Ain't nobody gave me no Great Lakes hoodie. I'm going to throw that out. Okay, cool. Um, ain't nobody gave me one yet. So, okay. Um, what are we talking about? My story. That's it. All right. <laughs> My story. Um, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 uh, to get into this teaching. You know, I'm always honored uh, when I'm allowed to come and either kick off a new series or be the closer of a series. And I get to shut this one down uh, and, and I'm excited. This is the last week, right? I'm shutting this down. Good. Um, First Peter chapter two, verse nine says, but you're not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Look at your neighbor real quick and say, you're not like that. 
And don't fix my grammar either. Say it just like, you not like that. Good job. Each of us has a story, right? Uh, we're on this unique journey in life that has all these different twists and turns along the way. And Jesus invites us into a story that is way better than anything we can imagine on our own. And as we encounter the challenges that play a part in the stories of our lives, I, I want to remind you about your identity in Christ Jesus. I mean, the most important part of any story is character development. I mean, think about movies that win awards and, and, and books that win awards and shows and musicals. You know, character development is extremely important. Understanding who the characters are always enhances the story. Matter of fact, it's what separates good stories from not so good stories. And in the story of your life, I, I want to take a moment to talk through some character enhancement. Who are you? And that really brings us to this text because Peter is addressing who God's people, the church, are called to be. The challenges of navigating difficult times and culture is immense in the moment that Peter is writing this to the church in Turkey. It's difficult. And I just need to say here that that challenges navigating culture is not something that is new. From the very beginning, the, the church has struggled against the culture that exists around it. So Peter is encouraging the church to put away specific negative attitudes and action. He, he says that we should grow in our appetite for the things of God. He reminds the church that Christ is our foundation and that we have an identity that is rooted in our relationship with Jesus. And I find his message in verse 9 so on point for where we are in this season as the church. Identity is important. You need to know who you are and who you are not. Midterms were Tuesday. And I know folks are happy about who got elected and folks are upset about who got elected. And so in the aftermath of this political season, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember who you're not. Peep game. You're not really a Democrat. Amen or ouch. Never mind. Be quiet. You don't want to know you're Democrat. <laughs> you're not really a Republican. That's not who you are. Church, that is not who we are. Vote, yes, but don't get sucked into the talking points. Because God doesn't have a party. But let me say it another way. No party actually carries the totality of biblical worldview. Say amen or ouch there. Amen. Can we have a real conversation right now, please? You know, I really struggle politically because I can't find enough Jesus in either party. Like, like I can't wholeheartedly follow any party because either party, both parties don't represent for me biblical worldview. You know, it's like picking and choosing like, OK, I see that and that aligns with, with scripture and that aligns with scripture. But wait, that don't and wait, that don't. And so I struggle politically in our country because I can't find enough God in either party. Like, I believe that God deeply cares about the sanctity of life. He, he cares about what happens to unborn children. And, and so to be pro-life represents a biblical worldview. But God also deeply cares about justice and how people groups are treated in our country and taken advantage of or denied access to resources. And so I struggle. Parties pick perspectives on these issues but make no mistake about it, neither of them really represent the church. God is not an American calling us to evangelize the world with democracy. He has a kingdom that is in this world, but not of this world. If you're mad, don't leave the church because I won't be here next week. <laughs> Y'all gonna be sending Dave emails. See, I can't be. Nope, just, just be like that Kirby, he just say stuff. Dave will be back next week. Don't worry about it. But for real, our identity in Christ goes beyond party and country or skin color or ethnicity or social status. It, it, it is deeper than all of those things. Peter, Peter reminds the church that in difficult times, 
in seasons where, where culture seeks to pull the church apart. Don't forget who you are. Don't get lost in the shuffle. Don't get caught up in what they're saying. Who, who are you? This one verse packs so much. This is what it says. Number one, you're a chosen people. Ch- chosen. Uh, in the original text, it's a word that, that doesn't just mean picked out or selected, but, but it means the best of its kind. So that's a good place to clap uh, when you come back and watch this tape later. Because <laughs> you done missed it, so we can't go back and redo it. Um, it, it doesn't just mean selected. It, it means the best of its kind. It, it means that you and I represent the best that God has to offer. You are God's prized creation. Y'all looking at me crazy. I'll put Bible on it. Psalms 8, 4 and 5 says, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. The, The psalmist is reflecting on our humanity and he's left dumbfounded because God has invested so much in us. The creation of humanity was a major flex for God. I'm sorry. I shouldn't talk about it. You don't know what that means. God was showing off. That's the better way. When he created humanity, he he had the nerve to reach down and create something out of dirt and impart himself into it and then place it over everything else he created. He made us in his image and likeness, and we are the very offspring of God. He, He literally did his best work in the earth using dirt. Like, how dope is that? Listen, you are God's plan. There ain't no plan B. We are it, ladies and gentlemen. The the church is God's plan. We are his people. We are his plan for the earth. And maybe if we realize who we are as God's best, it will impact how we live and what we do and the choices we make. I think there's a confidence that comes with understanding we are God's best. I think there's a self-esteem that is attached to understanding that we are God's plan, that we are his best, and that he loves us. We are his prized creation. We are the beloved of God. Second thing, not, not only that, he says, you are royal priests. When we hear this word priest, right away we should connect it to sacrifice. The word of God teaches us that we present our bodies, right, as a living sacrifice. What is the greatest thing that I can give God? Me. My my life. God is looking for a living sacrifice. He wants us submitted to him. Listen, don't miss this. The message of the New Testament is not just Jesus is the answer. It is that Jesus is Lord. Y'all heard what I'm saying? In the Bible, we find the word Savior 37 times. We see the word Lord 7,736 times. He is not just the answer. He, he, is, he is Lord. And the word Lord actually means owner. You think like landlord, the person that owns the property. Lord means owner. And so to be in Christ is to sacrifice our lives by giving our lives to God. He he cares about what we think and what we want and how we feel. And he wants us to take all of those elements of who we are and then give them to him. We we, we are priests. But we're also royal. And I love that this word royal is attached. It, 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 It suggests relationship to the king. Not not only are we priests, but we are royalty. We are are connected to the king. We are sons and daughters of the king himself. And the good thing is, along with royalty comes authority and responsibility. God has given us authority in this earth. It is the job of the church to expand the kingdom. Don't forget, there ain't no plan B. Third thing, we're a holy nation. We are a nation 
that is set apart. I'm teaching good, whether you like it or not. We live differently than other people live. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. It it doesn't mean we act strange or like uppity or like we're better than people. You know, it doesn't mean that you can't engage in life and watch movies and do, you know, like me buying this artsy stuff. Like, (laughs) you know, like we're not supposed to just wear like robes and be like, no, we're not of this world. Just barefoot. But what that means is how we handle problems is different. Our perspective on situations and issues is different. It means that we live by a different set of rules than the culture around us. The kingdom of God operates in opposition to the kingdom of this world. I can go Bible. You know, when you study ancient Israel, right? But part of their problem was that they wanted to be like everybody else. That's part of their problem. Do you realize that, that when God establishes Israel as a nation, he does not give them a king? He creates a system. Read the book of Judges. He, he creates a system of judges to help rule over the people and help them make. He doesn't give them a king. Eventually, a king comes along. And you know why he gave them a king? Because he got tired of them asking. Everybody else got a king. Why we going to have? We got these stupid judges and everybody else got a king. God said, okay, you king. The story of ancient Israel is that God called, created, and commanded them to be different in order to draw the entire world to him. And they got stuck wanting to be like everybody else. And the story of Israel is a foreshadowing to the call of the church. Understand that as Christians, our primary identity is shaped by Christ. What Jesus did when he created the church was he created a nation within the nations so that all around the world that there will be people that that represent the kingdom of God infiltrating every kingdom on the face of the earth. I'm going too fast. The kingdom of God is a nation that exists within nations in the world, not of the world. And so we're called to bring the culture of our nation into the nations that we live in. The the word culture uh, is based in a Latin word, cultus. Uh, It it means worship. It also means value. Um, So so culture shapes what we value. It tells us what's important, what matters. And I think our problem is oftentimes we let other cultures that's not kingdom culture, shape us. And we qualify our Christianity by connecting it to other cultures. Y'all, this is good to me. I don't care what you say. So what we say is, I'm a a black Christian. I'm a conservative Christian. I'm a liberal Christian. I'm a white Christian. We connect other cultures and they become primary and then we line up our theology behind whatever the other culture is pushing. And what I've had to learn is that before I'm a black man, I'm a Christian first. And then all the other cultures that are part of my life line up behind who I am in Jesus Christ. We cannot let other cultures shape us and then try to attach Jesus to that. I know y'all don't like it, but it's true. I know you wanted me to simplify this thing and be like, listen, you can vote for God in this election. We're never going to be able to vote for God in no election. None of them. Guys, our hope is not in this culture. Yes, vote. Yes, do good where you can. But, but our hope is not in the, the culture doesn't have the answers. It doesn't. Fourth thing, I'm going to get out of here. This is who you are. 
You're God's very own possession. We are, we are, we are, here it is, a purchased possession. We are valuable. We, we have worth. We have been bought with a price. God paid top dollar for you. And somebody in here needs to know that, that you are valuable. You, you have worth. You are not an accident. God made you intentionally and he saved you purposefully. He paid full price for you. No discount, no coupon. He, he paid it. J Jesus paid our sin debt. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And all of us are sitting here alive, which means that somebody paid the price and died in our place. And really, the entire human race deserves to be wiped out because all of us have sinned and messed up and made bad choices. But, but Jesus paid what we owed. Y'all not getting it how I want you to. Um, let me tell you how blessed I've been the last few weeks of my life. The last, like, three weeks uh, uh, of my life. I, was, I walked in the door a minute ago, and, and one of the, the brothers in the back was like, yeah, I've been watching your travels on Instagram. Uh, and I started thinking about the stuff I've been doing just the last few weeks. Y'all. Three weeks ago, I was at the Milwaukee Bucks game, Milwaukee versus the Atlanta Hawks, and I was in the suite. And it was beautiful in the suite. I'd have to pay for food. I'd have to pay for beverages. They came around with a dessert cart. Oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and a couple weeks later, uh, I go to the Bucks game again, and guess what, y'all? I'm on the floor this time. Third row. On the floor. BMO club in the back. I ain't got to pay for nothing. I just go back there with my little bracelet on and just eat the whole game and just come out with snack. It's amazing. I was able to partake of something I couldn't afford to pay for. And it was a beautiful experience that, that I got to go to these places because somebody else paid the price. Y'all know I, I live on the preacher's salary, so I can't afford... <laughs> But somebody else paid the price so that I can enjoy and partake. You still missing it. Uh, God paid the price. And all of us get to partake of the goodness of God because he paid the debt that we owed that we couldn't afford to pay. Bible says he died that we might have life and life more abundantly, a.k.a. life to the max. I'm done. <laughs> Y'all know what I say that I ain't really done. It mean, it mean last thing. Okay. Um, that's who we are, though. That's who we are. And as a result, th th this is what Paul is saying. Understand who you are. And when you understand who you are, as a result, here it is, you can show others the goodness of God. It's so important that we understand our call to show others the goodness of God. We get to showcase the goodness of God through our lives and through our interactions with other people. When people come in contact with you, do they experience the goodness of God or is it something else? Don't answer because you might incriminate yourself. <laughs> what are you showing other folk? Like, what are you modeling? in your interactions and relationships, do they see Jesus in their relationship with you? We show others the goodness of God and how we treat people. Are we honoring people? Honor is value. Honor is the value we assign to other people. I think the problem or one of the things we wrestle with, I've been talking about culture, is that the culture we live in is so steeped in dishonor. It is so steeped in dishonor. Y'all, I've been seeing political ads and getting text messages from all these different parties for weeks and months. Our culture is steeped in dishonor. Y'all know I be on social media. I see y'all comments and posts. You, what idiot would do dishonor? Our culture is steeped in dishonor. And understand this, whenever we dishonor others, 
It, it is a sure sign that we're thinking only about ourselves. If dishonor is connected to selfishness, then honor is connected to selflessness. To honor has to do with thinking about other people and being considerate of others. And when you consider others before yourself, it doesn't mean you think less of yourself. But, but it means you take into consideration how other people feel and, and where other people are in life. Honor is the art of valuing relationship more than being right. You don't care about people because you just want to be right. And you want everybody to know how right you are. And you want to prove that you're right and show them that you're right. And, and, and you're willing to risk relationship and be disrespectful so that you can tell people and show people how right you are. But when we value relationship, it, it impacts how we talk to people, how we talk about people. I'm not saying shy away from difficult conversations. I'm not talking about uh, uh, not telling truth to people that we love and care about in moments when things are difficult. But what I'm saying is even when we have to have difficult conversations with people we love, that there's a way to do it and honor. Last thing, I'm going to leave y'all alone. We get to celebrate our testimony. Because we are the people that God brought out of darkness and into his wonderful light. But when we know who we are, it impacts how we treat other people. But, but, but two, we get to celebrate this amazing testimony that we were in darkness and God brought us out. Listen, don't, don't get so lost in the stresses and issues and challenges of life that, that you forget his light is wonderful. Salvation is wonderful, y'all. Right relationship with God is wonderful. And listen, you have to celebrate that, especially during difficult moments. Because there's times in life, and y'all know this, when, when, when hope is the only thing you got. When you have to remind yourself, God is still good even in this. God is still good in this moment. Listen, don't, don't let life snatch your joy. I've taught y'all before, we won't always be happy, right? That's different. But, but joy is resilient. Joy, joy stands on the truth regardless of what happens around it. It's why the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Don't ever stop celebrating your testimony. As we face challenges and, and, and we're down on ourselves because we're not where we want to be and we make mistakes and we take steps back and, and it feels like a back and forth grind sometimes, re remember where God brought you from. He, he brought you out of darkness and into this wonderful light. Our relationship with God and our relationship with other people it, it is a joy. Protect it. Hold on to it. Don't lose it. Lean on it. Look to it. This is who we are. This is who we're called to be. I'm done for real now. Let's pray. God, you're faithful and you're holy and you're righteous and you're wonderful. God, thank you that, that, that you called us to be a chosen people that we are royal priests. God, thank you so much that, that you've identified us. We are your, your prized possession. God, thank you that we are a holy people. God, thank you that you've taken us out of darkness and into the wonderful light. God, we pray that we would never lose sight of what you've done for us that we can always tap into the joy of our testimony in difficult seasons, that we never forget our story, where you brought us from and where you're taking us to. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. But the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can hang out with us every day at greatlakeschurch.com, the Great Lakes Church app, or on socials at Great Lakes Church. We'll see you next time.